Next issue you're confronted with is what I call the progressive nature of scientific language. I referred to this slightly earlier on okay, in that sense. Uh, the distinction, I think, between science and the humanities is that scientific discourse is cumulative. The, the, the language that the scientist, the physicist, the biologist okay, uses today is nowhere near similar to the language that, say, somebody who was engaged in biology in Mendel's time would have been using. The two would hardly be able to speak to each other in that sense, simply because of the addition of our new understanding, our new knowledge, and the new concepts. Now that's got a lot of implications, okay? First of all, it means that you're entering, as I said here, into a conversation uh, that's been going on for a long period of time. But it means that for the person who's new to that conversation, okay, the amount that you have to learn gets larger and larger. And you can see this particularly, I think, in the syllabuses. Uh, you can see this very much, I think, in the context, not so much of the physics syllabus, where often you have to search hard to find anything uh, on the physics syllabus that was uh, discovered or learned post-1932. Okay, but you see it very much in the biology syllabus with the emphasis on uh, genetics, DNA that, is, that has crept in, and all kinds of things that were not there 20 or 30 years ago. And that again makes it a particular challenge for you as teachers of science because of that additional content that you are faced with uh, offering. And that feedback, that language, that, that knowledge feeds back into everyday discourse and changes it. To the extent, for instance, I mean, DNA is a very, very good example where that notion of a helix and replication is something which exists out there in, in, in the society. You're then faced with this particular problem, uh, uh, which is that words, uh, uh, scientists would like, uh, there's something about science and that, that attracts people like myself, okay, that it, uh, particularly when you're at school, which it deals in certainty. None of this kind of messy, airy-fairy, well, it might be this and it might be this, on the one hand, on the other hand, okay, there is a right answer. Okay? Or, or you think there is a right answer. Okay? And the problem with words, in fact, is that they don't have one specific meaning. You end up with, okay, with these kinds of problems, okay, which have been used in research. Which sentence uses the word maximum correctly? Okay. So you present to the student these kinds of statements. The lazy boy always made the maximum effort to improve his work. The team won the maximum number of points and when relegated. We, he wanted to sell his car and make the maximum profit. Uh, by dividing the total of all the marks by the number of pupils who sat the test, the teacher was able to work out the maximum mark. Now, I know you all uh, found the right answer without any difficulty. But okay, the sort of really surprising thing is that when you actually look at the results that you get when you do this with students, and I'm showing you the results for grade 7, grade 10, grade 12, this has been done several times over the years, uh, this is the kind of thing you get with these kinds of words, not maximum, but accumulate. Grade 7, only 21% can pick the correct answer in a multiple choice test of that nature. Uh, by grade 12, it's 72%, okay, which makes us a little bit happy, but even, okay, Okay, at that age, the fact that only 72% can pick the correct answer is a little bit worrying. And the mean is 44%. Uh, similar kinds of things, you might say, well, okay, you know, that's just that word. You know, it's a little bit difficult, complex. <laughs> Not sure about this. But similar kinds of things for uh, this, these words, device, random. Pretty common word in that science. Okay, the mean there is 30%, and only 50% get it right by grade 12 in terms of picking the right sentence uh, and theory, in that sense. So what you're confronted with is the fact that actually okay, the meaning of words has to be constructed from the context in which they are used. Okay. And the mean individual word you may understand the meaning of, but it only makes sense in the way in which it's used. And the fact that you are able to pick out that, that word maximum was used incorrectly was because it was inappropriate in the context which we was talking about. Maximum does not refer to the mean, okay, in, in that sense. So the last option was particularly wrong. What you're confronted with is the fact that basically words are polysemic. They have multiple meanings. And science teachers, I'm afraid, are, are as guilty of 
using them in this kind of way to anybody else. So, for instance, what does the word electricity mean? Okay. Which we all talk about. We're going to do electricity this, night, this term. Okay. Uh, but what do we mean? Electrical power? Okay. Are we talking about it as a means of delivering power? Are we talking about it electrical current? Okay. Are we talking about electrical voltage in that case? Or are we talking about electrical charge? Now, I would hazard a guess that if I went in and watched most lessons on electricity uh, in that sense, the word electricity would get used in this vague and ambiguous way because it's a kind of shorthand reference where you can work out the meaning from the context. So, for instance, if you look at these kinds of sentences uh, 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 like this, the demand for electricity was low. Okay? The context tell you that in this case what we're talking about is electrical power. Okay? But you've actually you know, got to learn and have the opportunity to do that. If you talk about electricity nearly killed him, it could be voltage, okay. or it could be current, depending upon your understanding. It's actually, in reality, it's current, if you really want to argue about it, that he's the killer. So it should be, be electrical current. Uh, and today's society needs more electric cars. Uh, again, really, is a reference to electrical power. So, Lang, unfortunately, okay, words don't have that fixed to your meaning. You can try and be precise in that sense, but we're often not. And you have to help your students see the context and interpret it in the context. And that means that reading texts becomes a process of inquiry. Okay? You are inquiring into meaning. And if you don't do that with your students, you're leaving them to do it on their own. And you're hoping that they will succeed. So that, to my mind, I think, is a big argument for why offering students to engage in reading, reading together with them, is critically important in terms of coming to understanding science. There's another difficulty. Let me show you this particular difficulty. Uh, uh, this is uh, from examples that I have uh, used with students. This is an example of a traffic diversion. Uh, and there are various things we can say about this traffic diversion, and we can use a word, scientific word, force. But we can use it in a scientific sense or a non-scientific sense. So here is a sentence about this situation. A force from the police officer causes the cyclist to turn right, which is grammatically correct. There's nothing wrong with the English. Most of us know what is being said, but it's not using the word force in a scientific sense. And that's the problem particularly for the physics teacher, because the physics teacher has to confront it with all these words like energy, force, power, uh, mass, weight, which are out there in the common jar everyday jargon, but they've got different meanings. And all of a sudden, what you're confronted with is the process of explaining the specific meaning in the specific context of, of its use. Whereas the, the second example, a frictional force acts on the bicycle, is a scientific use of the word, as is forces of reaction from the road uh, act on the police officer and the cycle. And the ability to distinguish between those is critically important in terms of conveying meaning uh, to students. Okay, so that was the second uh, problem with language, the fact that it is polysemic. 